And for those of you who are watching online, thank you so much for joining us today, for being part of our congregation. Lovely to be able to share God's word with you. May, may I ask you a question this morning? And uh, you may want to give yourself a couple of seconds to think about it um, before you come up to the, uh, with the answer. So here's the question. Of the following celebrations, which one to you is the least important? Christmas, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, or Pentecost? Okay, just give yourselves a couple of seconds to think about it. Okay. Um, and let's go through it. So, for, let's just show events. For which one of you would be the, the least important? If this is it, just put your hand, your hand up. Christmas? Okay, least important. Okay. Good Friday? Okay. Is a Sunday? Pentecost? That's kind of a tough one, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> You see, many Christians, because of our congregational and cultural emphasis, um, the first three probably would be the ones that we would look at, and we would say, well, if, if I really have to choose, I probably would put Pentecost in that list, okay? But just think of the following. Without Pentecost, the other three dates would not be celebrated at all. There could not have been a Good Friday without the advent of Christ coming to earth, something which we celebrate at Christmas time. And Good Friday would be nothing else more than a meaningless, brutal, barbaric execution without the resurrection of Jesus on Easter. But it is Pentecost that enables the gift of faith in us by which we know that the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are for us. Soon after Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave us the gift of his Spirit to live in us. And this Sunday, we celebrate Pentecost. We celebrate the arrival of the Holy Spirit to live in us as we become believers. Yes, yes, I know that we may not have the exact date of what happened 2,000 years ago. Uh, I can't tell you that Pentecost happened on the 28th of May, 33 AD. Uh, we know that Easter changes every year because it's based on the lunar cycle. And Pentecost is linked to Easter, and so it changes every year. Pentecost happened 50 days after uh, Sunday Easter. So it's a remembrance that gets changed every year. What is important isn't so much the date, but the fact that we have one day when we start to think, when we celebrate the outpouring of God's Spirit upon His people soon after Jesus ascended to heaven. And so this year we celebrate Pentecost on the 28th of May, today. But today is also the day when we celebrate or we come to the end of our 21 days of prayer. And this was not a coincidence. We plan to do so. We have done so to remind ourselves just how important it is that we consider the role of the Spirit of God at work in our lives and in our prayer life. And to do so this morning, I would like to look at a few verses from the book of Acts. Um, if you're kind of newish to the Bible, let me give you a little background to the passage before I read it. Uh, the book of Acts forms part of what we call the New Testament. These two divisions in the Bible, the Old Testament, more about the history of the nation of Israel. The New Testament, it's the Gospels, the story of the life of Jesus, and then the story of the early church. And the book of Acts comes straight after the Gospels in the beginning, and it tells the account of um, the decades that followed immediately after the resurrection of Jesus. Sometimes the book of Acts is in fact called the Acts of the Early Church because it describes the birth and the early years of the church. It was written by Luke, who was the same person who wrote one of the Gospels that we know so well. And, and as we get to chapter 13 of this book of Acts, we find a, a record, an account of what happened at a prayer meeting that was being held in a church church 
in the city of Antioch. Okay, so that's the background. Now let's look at the passage. Acts chapter 13 from verse 1. Among the prophets and the teachers of the church of, at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius from Cyrene, Manan, the childhood companion of King Abbot Antipas, and Saul. One day, as in these men were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and praying, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And they went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed to the island of Cyprus. And there, in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. And John Mark went with them as their existence. Uh, okay, let's see what these verses have to say to, to us today. These verses, we see how Paul and Barnabas are being commissioned to what we have now come to call Paul's first missionary journey. The church in Antioch, a city which was really in modern-day south-central Turkey. Um, this was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Acts 11, just a few chapters before, tell us that Paul and Barnabas have been working in that church for about a year. Um, and it's in this town, in this, in this city, that Christians, that believers are called Christians for the first time. <clears throat> now, in Acts chapter 13, we see the end of Paul and Barnabas' time working in that church. And as we read the, the verses, uh, could you tell me, um, what specifically was the church praying for? We can't. The text says, who was there? It lists the prophets and the teachers who were praying together. <clears throat> Paul, so-called Saul, and Barnabas. Simeon, somebody we know to be from Africa. A man um, from Cyrene named Lucius, may have been a non-Jewish convert. Someone called uh, Nemean, who was, we had really some pretty powerful connections. So this was kind of a multi multiracial, multicultural, socially, economically diverse group together praying. So we know what's there. The text also tells us what they were doing there. They were worshipping and fasting. They had set time aside to worship, to focus on Jesus, and fasting was part of that process. So we know what's there. We know what they were doing. But we don't know what we're praying for. And I think that may well be the point. Literally, all we know about this prayer gathering is that they were worshipping and fasting. And during this time, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And out of that comes the first principle for us this morning. See, sometimes God intervenes following times of worship and fasting. Sometimes God intervenes when the church comes together to pray and to fast. In a way, the verses are telling us that if we want to see God intervening in our situation, we need to give attention to our worship. And yes, we, as individuals, we can worship. There's absolutely no doubt about it. In our private time, we certainly do that. We can spend time alone worshiping God. But there is another dynamic, another important dynamic in worship, and that is corporate worship. Something special happens when God's people come together to worship. But I think it's important that we also define what worship is. Focusing on worship doesn't mean that we sing one more worship song on a Sunday doesn't mean that we try to increase the emotional pitch of our worship services. <clears throat> Lift up our hands a little bit more. Close our eyes a little bit more. Yeah, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that we try to get more emotional. In fact, if you really take these verses apart, what you find is that 
when we come to worship, when we come together, every other agenda that we have needs to be left at the door. Every self-centered opinion, every attempt to impress someone else, every selfish thought as to whether my needs are being met or not met as I come into a worship gathering, all that needs to be left in the parking lot. Worshiping is giving God the glory, the honor, the importance of what is due to Him. Is the one upon we focus. Everything else is simply put aside. Worship is not about us. Worship is about God. So, these verses tell us that when God's people worship, God intervenes. But not only worship, so it also talks about fasting. Well, what about fasting? Well, Matt preached about us as we began our 21 days of prayer, so I'm not going to develop the theme, except to say that Jesus assumed that we would fast. Remember those words that we find in Matthew 6, 16, words of Jesus and when you fast, do not look gloomy and so on and so on. It doesn't say if, but when. So, what are these verses saying to us today? Sometimes God intervenes following times of worship and fasting. And then secondly, openness to the Holy Spirit leads us to hearing His voice. Something happened in verse 2 of this chapter that is really, really rare in the New Testament. We get a direct quote from the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's, as far as I know, there's only one other person in the New Testament where we find a direct quote from the Holy Spirit. That's when the Spirit told Philip to go and meet the eunuch, and there was an evangelistic conversation taking place. And here in chapter 13, verse 2, we read that the Holy Spirit speaks directly to those who were praying. And what did he say? Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that, which I have called them to. How did they know that the Spirit was talking to them? Did they hear an audible voice from heaven? We really don't know. What happens though is that it was so clear that it's mentioned in these verses. Now, it's worth asking the question, why doesn't that happen more often? Wouldn't it be so much easier if the Spirit of God spoke to us in an audible voice? Just think of how many bad mistakes we would have been saved from if the Spirit just spoke to us once in a while in an audible voice. The truth is that the Spirit of God does speak to us. Yes, may not always be, in fact, it's not an audible voice, but it does speak to us. Sometimes it is that strong emotion that, that tells us that we need to do or not to do something. It is such a strong sense that we know that we have to respond to it. But most times I believe God speaks to us in another way. The author of Hebrews says this at the beginning of his book. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed the heir of all things, and so on and so on. So when people say that God does not speak to me, the answer is that God actually does speak to us. He speaks through His Son, He speaks through His spoken words. In fact, let's face it, if we heard from God in sort of audible form very often, then we would begin to think that this was the best way to hear from God. And eventually we would think that this was the only way to hear from God. We would stop looking at what Scripture has to say. We would stop learning from the life of Jesus. And we would stop putting all our faith in the words that anyone would come to us and say, I have this direct message from God. That's why at EBC, when somebody says something that they believe is coming from God, we ask ourselves, does it contradict what the Bible says? Does it contradict what we see in the life of Jesus? Because if it does, then it's not from God. So, what are these verses saying to us? Well, sometimes God intervenes 
following times of worship and fasting. Then openness to the Spirit of God leads us to hearing what He's saying to us. And then thirdly and finally, when we are open to the Spirit of God, He uses us in the extension of the Kingdom of God. Verse 2. One day as these men were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. And after more fasting and prayer, they lay hands on them and they sent them on their way. This was the beginning of something that would literally transform the world. As Paul and Barnabas and Mark, John Mark go to Cyprus, they begin what we now call Paul's first missionary journey when a number of churches were planted. At one aside, um, as we look at this name, uh, as we look at these verses, we know that in doing this missionary journey, John Mark left the others halfway through it and he returned home. We don't know what happened. We don't know if he just missed home. We really have no reason. What we do know is that Paul was less than impressed with the actions of John Mark. And so when the second missionary uh, journey began to be planned and there was some interest in taking John Mark again, Paul would have none of that. No way on earth was he going to take him. In fact, Paul was so anti-John Mark that he and Barnabas had this massive argument and they ended up going in different directions to plant churches. And John Mark, um, was that the end of him? Well, not quite. In fact, you may have read quite a bit of what was written by him. Years later, he wrote the first gospel that we have, the Gospel of Mark. So don't ever think that, because you may have missed in the past, that God will not use you again. Back to Paul's first missionary journey. That was followed by the second missionary journey, which we read in Acts 16. More churches were planted, and more areas of the Roman Empire were reached. And the Church of Jesus Christ hasn't stopped growing since then. Today, <clears throat> around our world, around 2.5 billion people have met or will meet to worship Jesus Christ. <coughs> when we open to the Holy Spirit, He uses us in the ways that extend the kingdom of God. Okay, so far so good. What do these verses say to us this morning? We all know that God is wanting to do a new thing among us as a church. We've been feeling this for the last two years, but there seems to be kind of an urgency, a sense of urgency about it. That God has been speaking to so many people in our church, all drawing us to the same conclusion, to the same thing. The image that God is wanting us to move from our current situation into something that is planned for us, which is so much better. You still remember the image of sheep being moved from one field to another where pastures are much greener? I watched it with you last two Sundays ago. Oh, God was saying this to two ladies in a totally different context with two years apart from each other. At the end of that Sunday, um, one of the men in our church came to me and he felt that God was saying that the ground of the field where we are at the moment is hard, it's not producing as much as we like. But new field, the ground is soft and, pert and fertile and it will produce so much more. And is that kind of what we've been feeling? We've prayed, we've done things and so on, and we see some results here and we see some results there, but we so long for that real harvest. Let me end by sharing something which is kind of personal. I don't often comment, and certainly not from the stage how I'm feeling. Um, today I'm going to make an exception, okay? And if someone had to ask me how I'm feeling, I'll have to say I'm feeling somewhat tired, and I'm physically and emotionally tired. I've got a couple of weeks coming up in June, and boy, am I so looking forward to it. Um, you may have heard me saying that taking church through COVID was not fun, and the demands of those days uh, were not fun. But I can tell you that taking the church out of COVID has been far more demanding. No ministry uh, teaching ever 
prepares you for the things that we went through the last few years. But having said all that, I also need to tell you that in, in the 30 odd years that I've been in the ministry as a pastor, I have never felt such a deep sense of excitement and anticipation as I've been feeling lately. I am so convinced that as a church, we are at the brink of something that is going to be so great. The prayers that have been prayed, the commitment of God's people. We heard the finance of God's people have sacrificed so much over the last few years. And there's been this real desire. And I am so convinced that we are at that moment of stepping out in faith. And not talking about more programs and events or anything like that. More of a visitation of the Spirit of God among us. Seeing people being saved. How many of you have been praying for family members for so long? Don't we want to see that? Seeing lives being restored. How many relationships do we know that really need to be restored? Seeing prayers being answered. Seeing God doing a new thing among us. In a couple of moments, we, we're going to end our time together. In fact, we are not even going to sing our last song because the time is going by. But I'd like to ask you to do something for just a few minutes before I finally close in prayer and then we, we go home and we have our coffee and so on. I'd like to ask you that we spend just a few minutes in the quietness of this moment asking the Holy Spirit to meet with us as a body of believers. And for some of you, this may feel mm, somewhat uncomfortable. <laughs> it's not quite a, the type of thing that we're used to. But this morning, will you give yourself permission to just let go a little bit and maybe let God have a little bit of you? A few moments asking the Spirit of God to meet with us as a body of believers. In a couple of seconds, you're going to see the words of a song that we sing in our church. Let's allow these words to be our encouragement this morning. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Come, flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And so in the quietness of this moment, won't you simply come before God and say, Spirit, I'm open. I'm here. Come visit us. Father, as a group of your people, there is in us, among us, this deep sense of knowing that you are moving us to something new. There's such a sense of expectation at the good things that you have in store for us as a church. Lord, even I pray that, as I pray that, I realize that the call is upon us as you bless us, for us to be a blessing to this town and to those around us. But I realize that we can only do that as we are empowered by your Spirit. And so come, Spirit, this morning. Fill this place, this group of people, with your power. And then send us out to the break of the kingdom of God. In Christ's name, amen.